So on the mobile side, right, I think everybody knows, you know, just throughout the day, everybody knows what, how these devices have changed uh, our world, right? And um, I see people with, with uh, taking screenshot or, you know, taking photos, checking their schedule, doing everything on the phone. Um, it's hugely important for us, you know, I think, uh, um, again, from, the, from an operator perspective, all the operators here have to deal with uh, the, mobile, the mobile challenge as well, right? For us... Facebook has over a billion um, monthly mobile users. I think by by uh, by accounting something like 25% of mobile time in North America is spent like on Facebook or Instagram, and there are a bunch of other folks using you know who are who are delivering all their content on mobile. So um, that is the topic of this of our final talk. So Peter from our uh, uh, traffic team, our mobile networking team. Well, we'll be going over some of the mobile networking challenges. And, you know, when you look at that phone, I think we're all networking folks. But just remember, the networking that's going on on that phone, you know, somebody actually during break was telling me, like, hmm, how's the connectivity in this room? You know, it, it's, uh, it's, it seems a little bit slow. But uh, you, you just take it for granted. You take it for granted how good that is. Um, but there are a lot of folks behind the scenes who are working to make that experience on mobile seamless. So with that, please help me welcome Peter. All right, thanks, Omar. Uh, is this guy? Here we go. All right, cool. So uh, my name is Peter Grice. Uh, I work here at Facebook. I'm going to talk to you today about Proxygen Mobile, which is our new library for uh, improving the way mobile apps are able to use the network. So um, anyway, uh, <laughs> this slide is a little bit of historical context. Last night, our legal team told me that I couldn't use the internal code name for our project. So you have no idea what this is in the background. Uh, I'm now calling this co Proxygen Mobile. But perhaps you can guess what the code name is. Um, <laughs> so um, it's actually been really, like, I'm really glad to be going last here. Um, <laughs> not only because many of you are probably asleep and won't hear me screw up, but also because um, it's been really great hearing over and over again people hammer home the set of themes that have really kind of emerged as being important for us in building uh, these ne uh, networking stack for mobile devices. Uh, themes like uh, observability, uh, the importance of controlling the entire stack uh, from top to bottom and from end to end, and the value you derive from, from that. Um, and so kind of in understanding the set of stuff both uh, in the infrastructure organization at Facebook over the last couple of years and in building, uh, taking what we've learned in building Proxygen to the mobile stack, uh, excuse me, to the mobile side, um, this has really been something that's, that's kind of proved its value for us. So uh, last year, we released uh, Proxygen uh, as open source. Proxygen is our uh, kind of framework for building high performance proxies in C++. It supports HTTP, Speedy, TCP, et cetera. Um, this was built out of uh, anger and frustration with some of your favorite L7 load balancers. Um, but you know, in building this thing, we, we learned a lot about what it takes to build a high performance uh, HTTP stack. And, you know, it's, and a lot of these lessons are directly applicable to uh, the client side. Um, so what we did is we repackaged this stuff as a library that is linkable with mobile apps. Um, it provides both a drop-in replacement for uh, existing APIs that ship with iOS and Android, uh, and also special purpose APIs that let you uh, do interesting things, which we'll get to talk about. Um, in particular, mobile networking is very different than uh, networking in data centers, and we're going to kind of get into that. Um, and again, this type of control that you get from owning the stack, both from top to bottom on the client and from end to end between client and server, lets you solve a lot of these problems. So uh, mobile networking is, is pretty different than uh, data center networking, as we've talked about. Um, you know, my colleagues at Facebook uh, had a really interesting presentation uh, right before lunch where they talked about the type of care and precision you can take when designing a data center network, how you can plan for capacity, how you can lay cables out precisely. And I mean, to me, it doesn't look like these cables are laid out very precisely. But uh, uh, then again, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about cabling. Um, but Mobile networks tend to have very different properties than, um, than kind of these like tightly planned uh, networks uh, in data centers. Uh, they tend to emerge over time, particularly in uh, emerging markets. Um, rarely do you have these uh, large ISPs with a lot of capital that are just going to, out of nowhere, drop a state-of-the-art network on the population. Stuff kind of grows organically. Uh, and it can be very different, uh, excuse me, very difficult as, uh, as an app developer to reason about what's going on in the network and to make good choices uh, when building products. Um, and so we need new and better tooling uh, for actually solving these challenges. Um, the 
APIs that come with the mobile platforms on iOS and Android are uh, very powerful in the sense that it's very easy to issue HTTP requests or open sockets, and, and that's great. Um, but they obscure a lot of important information and a lot of uh, take a lot of the decision making power out of the hands of applications, and so uh, you can end up having uh, subpar performance and security. Um, and again, like this type of ability to control your destiny is really, really important for operating both networks, uh, but also products at scale. So um, I don't know about you, but this is often my experience uh, using my phone, uh, particularly when I'm in my house and I'm looking at my base station and I can see that I have zero bars of connectivity. Uh, it's, it's not really a happy time. Um, there are a lot of challenges with mobile networking that are uh, not the same or uh, slightly different than they are uh, in wired networking. Um, there are kind of a couple different things that come into play. Uh, signal strength, you know, if you're connected to a cell phone tower and you're, you know, you can see the thing and everything is going great and you, uh, you know, go drive under a bridge, uh, that signal strength may, may drop and bandwidth will drop and, uh, you know, latency will increase. Um, likewise, uh, if you're, say, driving in your car and you're connected to one cell phone tower um, and you get closer to a different tower, those towers may communicate between each other to hand off your connection, which can cause problems. Um, so there's a lot of kind of, um, yeah, so uh, there are kind of a lot of issues with, with handing off connections there. Um, there's mobile NATs. Uh, many of the larger carriers offer a relatively small set of NATs from which uh, phone traffic egresses uh, to the Internet at large. Uh, in the U.S., for example, uh, a couple of the larger carriers only have like a handful of NAT points around the country. So your traffic, uh, even though you could be looking at, uh, you could be you know parked in your car in front of one of Facebook's data centers. Uh, in fact, your traffic is egressing you know hundreds of miles away somewhere else. Um, uh, data usage is really important as well. Uh, many uh, many people, particularly in other countries, have data plans that are very. Uh, uh, have relatively low capacity and people are very price constrained. And so you really want to think twice before giving them uh, lots of content that requires a lot of bandwidth. Um, Facebook and other companies uh, can deal with this in some ways by striking zero rating deals with ISPs where um, ISPs will not charge their users for traffic to particular websites. Um, but you know this is more the exception than the rule. So um, it's not super common. Um, power usage is another thing. You know, running the radio is one of the most expensive things power-wise that you can do on the phone, and so you don't want to just have the radio on all the time. You just can have this hot brick in your pocket before it dies. Um, and all these things are highly dynamic. You know, um, writing, kind of dealing with any of these things at any point in time is challenging enough, but many of these things change frequently enough that you know, in the few minutes that you're running an application, several of these things could have changed, and you want the app to be able to react to this. So, all right, so all that is pretty complicated, but it's even more complicated by the fact that there are multiple platforms that are important to support. You know, Facebook has apps that run on all the major platforms today, iOS, Android, Windows, Blackberry, et cetera. Um, and you have to solve these problems for each of the platforms. Um, it's a challenge to share implementation details between these platforms, not only because of the language barrier. Uh, on iOS, obviously, you're writing things typically in Objective-C, on, on, and on Android, you're writing things in Java. Um, and so you end up implementing things multiple times, and you have uh, different bugs, features land at different times, tuning is different. Uh, it's just a really big challenge um, and requires a lot of manpower to get right. Um, all right, so let's kind of walk through an example here. So let's say you're going to stream a video, and you know if you've just listened to the presentation uh, from Netflix, you'll kind of uh, you gave a little bit of a preview as far as kind of some of the things that are involved here. So. You know, just thinking through some of the some of the issues that I mentioned before with what goes on with mobile networks and what you have to think about from a product experience. Let's take that and kind of run that through what it takes to play a video. So uh, we're going to play this video, right? Um, what are some decisions that we have to make along the way? Well, one is what type of bitrate do we choose? Um, we would like the user to see a nice uh, HD video. We want to choose a nice high bit rate. That's great for engagement. Users love high definition content. But at the same time, uh, if you don't have a lot of bandwidth, you don't want to sit there and buffer the thing for 20 minutes before hitting play. Nobody's going to sit there and wait for that, right? So th there's a trade off there. Um, how do you select for user experience versus network usage? Um, how much time do you actually want to spend buffering initially versus uh, buffering later, right? You can. But, uh, download the entire video and play it all at once, or you can download a little bit of it, start playing with the expectation that, yeah, you may have to buffer a little bit later, but if the user ends up not watching the rest of it, it doesn't really matter. Um, in order to make these choices, you need a good estimate of bandwidth, and that can be really difficult to do, particularly given the network conditions can change dynamically. So, um, you know, what can you do to estimate the available bandwidth, and what can you do to predict what the bandwidth is likely to be over the lifetime of the stream? Um, 
what do you need to know about what the user is paying for bandwidth? Um, if the user has a zero rating contract with their ISP and you know Facebook or whoever has a relationship with that ISP, then maybe that's something you take into account. You're less bandwidth conscious. But if that's not the case, you know, do you really want to burn the, the user's entire bandwidth for the month watching you know, a 30 second HD clip of something? Like probably not if you're that user. Um, so you know, as a developer that's building kind of this product, you really need to think through all of this information on the network and how it's going to impact user experience. And that can be incredibly challenging. Uh, even assuming all this information is available, it's very difficult to figure out the best way to use it. OK, so playing videos is just one example um, of things that apps do. Uh, so here we have the Facebook news feed. And I just want to give kind of a quick overview of some of the different things that occur when you're viewing, when you're using this app. Um, so first of all, we've got JSON responses. Um, you know, these are pretty small payload. It's text. It compresses pretty easily. Uh, not particularly exciting. Um, one thing that's kind of important about this, though, is that um, for something like Newsfeed, you know, even though this response is pretty small, you can't render anything until you get it. I mean, it's the thing that defines the skeleton for the entire part of the app, right? So it is actually really latency sensitive. You want to make sure this thing shows up as quickly as possible. Um, inside of Newsfeed or, you know, kind of anywhere else, photos are a big deal. Um, you've got these like relatively large objects that you're streaming down, um, but they're not critical to the experience. You know, if you're missing a photo, you you know it looks kind of crappy in the newsfeed, but you can still use newsfeed if you've got other photos or other stories in there. You can still interact with it, um, so they're important but not critical. Uh, you've got the streaming video, which we just talked about. Um, you've got uploads, so you know many of the photos get into our product and into other products by users uploading them. So here we have this large transfer that's going in the other direction. Uh, we've got chat as well. Um, chat is also very latency sensitive. You know, it's really important for engagement for users to feel like there's a live human on the other end of your chat. And if it's taking, you know, many seconds for the message to even get delivered, um, that just feels like, why am I bothering to use this product? Um, you know, companies like uh, WhatsApp actually have excellent latency optimizations, even on networks that are very bad. And as a result, the product uh, sees great engagement. People love using it. Um, and we also uh, support VoIP. You, know, you can make um, voice calls using our app, and that's you know, a totally different protocol. It's UDP. Latency is obviously very important as well. Um, but at the same time, the protocol and the product can handle packet loss. So you know, just within our, our little app, which on the surface seems not particularly complicated, you can see that there's a wide variety of different requests that are going on. So in general, this is just a pretty sad place to be. Uh, it's very difficult to figure out how to optimize this thing. There's so much going on. Many of these product features are developed in isolation of each other. They're not cooperating as far as sharing resources together. Um, and so like, how do you actually build this thing, and how do you optimize it? Um, assuming, again, assuming you have perfect knowledge of what's going on in the network, um, how do you make choices about what type of resolution do you request for your images? What type of bitrate do you request for videos? Um, how do you set prefetch limits? How do you choose timeouts? Um, which features are appropriate or even necessary to build uh, support for running when totally disconnected from the network? Um, these are all really challenging questions for products to answer. So uh, here's Mobile Proxygen. Um, we've developed, again, we've developed this library. Um, you just link it with your app, and you kind of get all these great features that I'll talk about. Um, but you know, this has been something that we've developed because, again, we just see over and over again how much value we derive from um, having control over each layer in our stack. Um, from you know, security to reliability to observability, knowing exactly what's going on and being able to control it uh, has just been really important for us to actually operate at scale. Um, and there have been many examples of this um, with services and software that Facebook's open sourced over the last year or two. Um, there's Proxim, which I mentioned before, Thrift, which is kind of our, our RPC and serialization library, Wangle, another kind of IO uh, and concurrency primitives library. You know, again and again, we see these same patterns emerge on pretty much every platform that we work in. So Mobile Proxygen, uh, it's a cross-platform library. Uh, it builds on iOS and Android. Um, it's designed to be very, very easy to embed in apps. Um, on uh, iOS, you can literally just link it with your app, and it just goes. Uh, you don't need to do anything different. Uh, there are special purpose APIs that you can use if you want to do things, uh, if you want to do things like uh, get additional information about what's going on in the network. But just out of the box, with very little integration effort, you get improved security, improved performance, improved reliability. It's just, it's just a win all around. Um, but again, if you want to use these kind of special purpose APIs, it gives you a lot of information about what's going on in the network. Um, 
Security-wise, this has been a big win for us. Um, you know, users entrust us with their private data, and it's very important that we try hard to uh, protect it. So we need to do whatever we can there, and that includes handling cases where the user is getting uh, being exposed to middle attacks, which unfortunately does tend to happen. Um, and speed, uh, performance is critical for uh, pretty much every feature of our app, and we need to do what we can to um, to enable uh, things to run quickly. Um, one of kind of this kind of seems a little bit out of place in this slide, but I, I do want to kind of get into this because it's important with uh, the way we developed Mobile Proxygen and, and why we did it is that um, each of the individual pieces, excuse me, uh, the library itself is composed of a bunch of different components that you can assemble together to build kind of complex functionality. Um, it is a library, but I like to think of it more as a toolkit. Um, if you look back to our app, there were many different features, and many of them were using HTTP, but also some of them were using non-HTTP protocols. Chat runs over a different protocol that runs on top of TCP. And so it was really important for us to provide actually a set of um, components that could be assembled together to solve many of the kind of common problems that people have when building these apps that use the network, rather than providing this like huge monolithic library that you know, took like a million configuration parameters and was difficult to tune. Um, Platforms and apps and features are all individually fairly, fairly varied, so we wanted to make sure that we had something that was easy to use and easy to set up for exactly what you wanted. Um, so this is built on open source. Um, uh, Facebook has uh, a couple of these pieces are from Facebook. Um, Folly is our open source C++ 11 library that was released uh, a year-ish or a year and a half ago. Um, we use that mainly for its I.O. primitives. Uh, Proxygen, uh, again, this is the reverse proxy framework that we released a little while ago. Um, it's got an HTTP and Speedy Engine and a couple, kind of, couple other pieces under the covers that, uh, that are useful. Uh, and we also built on top of OpenSSL. <laughs> uh, this is a little bit of a whipping boy in the industry over the last couple months or so. There have been a bunch of security issues that have been discovered and fixed uh, pretty quickly. Um, some with fancy names like Heartbleed and you know, websites and everything dedicated to them. But in general, like OpenSSL is well supported. Uh, issues get discovered, but they get fixed quickly. And in fact, Facebook is, you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're funding the core infrastructure initiative to support OpenSSL development. So you know, even though OpenSSL doesn't necessarily have the best track record uh, in the near past, uh, we're investing heavily in making sure that that gets shored up and, and things are in good shape. Um, all right. So, um, kind of back to the concept of these modular components. So the idea here is that as much as possible, we wanted to kind of construct our software using these really small building blocks that had really simple interfaces, are really easy to test, but and yet could be combined and to produce really interesting behaviors. Um, there's kind of an analog here with the Rtable talk where kind of just this simple concept of chaining allowed you to kind of compose together these really interesting behaviors with replication and such. So, and there's kind of uh, similar ideas here. So one example is um, this notion of a transport. Um, so for us, a transport is just something uh, looks like a socket. You can write bytes to it, and you can read bytes back from it. There are transports for just talking to, you know, to a TCP socket. There are transports for talking to an SSL socket. Obviously, you write plain text to it, uh, you read plain text out, but things end up getting pushed upstream uh, encrypted. So that's what a transport is. Uh, we've also got this thing called a transport connector, which will get you a transport given a set of criteria. Um, the criteria is typically things like host name, um, this is who I'd like to connect to, this is a list of IP addresses uh, that you should connect to, um, and this is how much time I'm willing to wait for it. So um, that's a pretty simple interface. Uh, each of our transport connectors supports just this interface, one function, it's real easy. Um, and yet you can kind of combine them to produce really interesting behavior. Uh, if you go all the way on the far right, you'll see that we just have a socket connector. Uh, this does what you'd expect, just, you know, calls socket to create a socket, and then calls connect to connect to it. Pretty simple. Um, but you know, these things fail. Um, there can be timeouts. There can be, um, you, know, you might not have a route to that particular host. Um, and so uh, things can break. And so um, layered on top of that socket connector, we have a retry connector. If something fails uh, and we still have time left in our timeout, the retry connector will try again. Not, not super fancy, but again, you've layered this on top, and now you've got a little bit more behavior that you can kind of build something more reliable on top of. Uh, we've also got a happy eyeballs connector. You know, many of our uh, services are available on both uh, IPv4 and IPv6, so we want to make sure that we operate well in kind of these mixed environments, and uh, so we implement the happy eyeballs algorithm using this connector. Uh, we've got DNS and TLS layered on top of that, so again, each of these things does one thing, does it pretty simply, uh, and then gets out of the way. 
So this, that all seems OK, but um, you can kind of see where this becomes important when you think about what happens when the user changes networks. So let's say you're using your phone, and uh, you're connected to a cell tower, and you uh, end up uh, pulling up in your driveway to your house. Uh, well, this is maybe not a great example, because who would have a proxy configured on their, on their home network? But let's say you do. So you pull up, and your, your home network is configured such that you need to use a SOX proxy to get to the internet. Um, so what happens? Well, um, our network stack will reconfigure itself to change out the, one of the transport connectors in the way here. We still want to be able to open up a socket to our, uh, to our SOX proxy. We still want to retry if that thing fails. But we don't want to do DNS resolution, because we want to delegate that to the proxy. And we don't want to do happy eyeballs, because the proxy is going to do that for us. Um, but at the same time, we still want to negotiate TLS on top of that. So um, here's a way where you know, we have not changed anything about the HTTP stack that's running. We haven't changed anything about most of the other connectors. But we've just swapped out a little piece of it with a little bit of extra functionality that knows how to speak SOX, and away we go. Um, you can see this concept play out as well on uh, other layers of our stack. For example, here we have HTTP. Excuse me. Um, the HTTP API is also relatively simple. Send a request and get a response back. Um, the request just has, you know, you're asking to fetch a particular URL, some headers and a body. There's other stuff too, but you know, for the purposes of this um, description, we'll just call it that. And again, you can kind of see this layering effect. You know, on the far right, you've got just the core thing that will um, make a single request and receive a single response. You've got a retry filter that will handle any errors that show up. For example, if you get a, you know, if you get a 500 error, you may want to retry only if the request is idempotent. Uh, if the request is a post or something, it's probably not a great idea. Um, but then you can layer additional functionality on top of that, like following redirects, uh, adding compression uh, via the accept encoding header, and you know, uh, decompressing the result as it comes back. So you know, kind of um, provides this way to, again, build complex functionality on simple pieces. OK, so if you're operating at scale and you're actually trying to understand what's going on uh, to your users and to your network and to your application, you really need to um, have visibility into what's going on at pretty much every layer. Um, and so we've spent quite a bit of time building out uh, tooling and instrumentation for understanding what's happening under the covers. Um, here's an example in like a really crudely <laughs> redrawn implementation of one of our internal tools. Uh, this is just a waterfall chart uh, that you can see of making a request. Um, you've got kind of the basic stuff you'd expect. The first two lines are making a request to fb.com. Um, you can see that both requests are waiting for some amount of time for DNS and TCP and TLS to complete. And then you go ahead and issue the request and get a response. Uh, for those first two requests, things are lined up so closely because uh, you can imagine that um, they're both actually going to end up using the same socket to do this thing. And so they're both waiting. Um, and when that socket comes back, it's speedy so they can multiplex in the same socket and kind of away you go. Um, for the third request, you can see that we're making a request to a host name called offline.net. Um, I don't know. I'm not trying to badmouth anybody here if they're an operator for offline.net, but I'm going to claim that offline.net is offline. And so once you've actually done the, T, uh, the DNS resolution for this, uh, for this host name and you try to connect to it, um, that connection doesn't work. And so here we can see that we tried three times to make connections to this thing before our timeout expired, and then we gave up. Um, each of these little kind of bars of time uh, comes with quite a bit of metadata about what's going on. So here you might see that um, you know, DNS got back uh, some number of IPs. Uh, each of these attempts to establish a TCP connection used a different IP. And so just from this trace data we've collected, we'll see you know, um, what we got back from DNS and what worked or didn't work uh, kind of at pretty much every layer. Uh, and then finally, we'll see that we'll make a different uh, request to fb.com again. And here we don't wait for uh, connection at all. We've already got one uh, ready to go in our session cache. And uh, we just use it, and off we go. OK, so uh, security is pretty important for us. Um, everybody around the world, tr well, not everybody, but many people around the world trust us with their personal data. Um, this is you know, everybody from you and me to people like celebrities and politicians. It's, you know, it's extremely important that we do uh, as much as we possibly can to, to protect this data and to protect our users. Um, and so what can we do now that we actually control uh, every layer of the stack here? Um, so we've implemented a lot of features, uh, some of which you might expect and some of which you might not. Uh, we've got certificate printing and certificate revocation. Uh, certificate pinning in particular is pretty important because, like I said before, there are uh, 
it's not as uncommon as you would hope for there to be bad actors that are man middling uh, their users, whether it's you know rogue ISPs or rogue countries or just you know companies that have a, a man in the middle proxy that they require their employees to go through. Uh, this is something that we want to make sure that we uh, prevent from occurring because we don't want users to be leaking their data to to third parties. Um, of course, we also handle revocation of certs. Um, uh, um, right, so. Uh, I mentioned about SSL before. Um, it's really important for us to ship the newest version of SSL whenever it comes out. Um, again, these unfortunately bugs are coming up in OpenSSL, but we're able to patch it quickly and release it quickly and oftentimes get it in the hands of our users within a couple of days. Um, so that's been a big win for us. Um, we also are able to take advantage of new features that come out in, a, in SSL. And by features, I mean typically new cipher suites. Um, we're not turning on any crazy experimental features in the protocol itself, but there are better ciphers that are coming out. Uh, particular stuff like ChaCha20 is coming out. Uh, I, think, I think it'll be out in, well, I think it'll be out in the next release. But in any event, we're able to take advantage of these new, new features as they come out. Um, the individual platforms, uh, iOS and Android, each have their own SSL stack that unfortunately we can't use directly. Um, but, uh, well, sorry, I, I suppose it's fortunate in some respects that we can't use it directly because they can uh, frequently come with bugs. Uh, Apple has the notorious go-to-fail bug that popped up uh, about you know, six months or a year ago. But that's not something that's work around, that you can work around. You have to wait for Apple to patch it. And you know, they did an okay job of patching it pretty quickly, but again, users don't always update that quickly, so it can be a problem. Um, many of the OpenSSL, uh, excuse me, on um, Many apps on, on these platforms aren't able to actually select which cipher suites they're using to communicate with the servers. For example, on, on Android, um, when we're not using mobile Proxygen, we just have to use the stock Android SSL stack, and that opts to negotiate um, with a kind of a hilariously insecure cipher suite with Facebook every time. It chooses RC4 MD5 like 70% of the time, which is like, yeah, it's. Not good. Um, but using, uh, using OpenSSL and being able to configure things directly, this is something that we can address and make sure that we're using something that is, uh, has the right kind of trade-off for performance and security. OK, so kind of going back a little bit to the observability that I talked about before, um, uh, we get a whole bunch of information from kind of every layer. And we also get a bunch of stuff from, from SSL as well. Uh, we learn what cipher suite was negotiated. We learn what cipher suites were offered by both parties. We see which uh, ALPN and NPN protocols were, were offered. And we get details of the cert, the chain of trust, how much time the cert is valid for, and the set of names that it's, that it's offering. So um, this is really helpful for us when we do see things like man-in-the-middle attacks or uh, certs that we're not expecting. This helps us kind of track down what's going on. Uh, performance is pretty important for us. Uh, one of the major reasons that we built uh, that we built the stack is so that we can actually do everything we can do to wring out every last bit of performance from the device. Um, a lot of this, a lot of the uh, kind of implementation details that we got, we um, did based on work from the browser vendors over the last year or two. Uh, the Chrome team, in particular, has been really great about um, doing research and publishing best practices for what it means to be a good HTTP stack. And so we've taken a lot of that stuff and, and run with it. Um, one of the things that is different between um, kind of a client-side app and a web browser is web browsers have a relatively specific task. Um, they download HTML, they download CSS, they download JavaScript, and then they execute AJAX if there's any AJAX on a page. Um, in contrast to an app, an app can basically do whatever, wherever, whenever it wants to. Um, and this is a pretty different environment from, uh, from browsers. And so having the ability to uh, intelligently schedule requests and to trade them off against each other is something that we found to be pretty valuable. Um, the app can um, change the priority of requests when they're in flight. For example, if uh, the app is loading a picture, um, excuse me, uh, say you're in the Facebook app and you've like zoomed in on a particular picture and you want to you look at it. Um, if that thing is loading and then the user decides, well, that was taking a while, I want, I want to give up on that and go somewhere else, um, we can actually lower the priority of that or cancel it all together so that we don't chew up the user's bandwidth, uh, either from a cost perspective or from the perspective of taking resources away from other requests that then need to complete. Um, so having kind of a sophisticated scheduler helps us address some of these issues. Um, and we can also work around bad TCP behavior. Uh, many of these devices are in the field for you know, years, um, and oftentimes these devices don't uh, come from a particularly up-to-date lineage of uh, TCP stack. Um, I know, uh, again, our colleagues at Google have done quite a bit of work over the last couple of years to um, 
uh, research and optimize TCP and to push those changes upstream to Linux kernel. Uh, we do run pretty up-to-date Linux kernels uh, on our CDN, um, but unfortunately, we don't have access to these features on the individual devices. They're often quite a bit further behind. Um, but knowing what some of these issues are, we actually can work around them in user space, um, and so we can do that. All right, so again, we control the whole, sh we kind of control the whole shebang, and so we can do a lot of weird stuff. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are maybe a little bit surprising that we do. So um, HTTP2 uh, is uh, coming out. I'm not sure if any of you guys are following this, but um, there's kind of quite a bit of interesting stuff going on in HTTP2. Uh, one of them is uh, the ability to uh, compress headers. Uh, Speedy supported this as well using gzip, but that proved to have some security issues, and so it's typically not turned on. Um, so what we did was we took uh, HBAC, which is the HTTP2 um, mechanism for compressing headers, and we ported it to Speedy uh, as an extension that's Facebook only. Um, so you know, for us, this let us have you know, the fact that we controlled both sides of the conversation, both the client side and the server side, let us say, you know what, we, uh, um, there's a particular technology and technique that we can deploy and that's going to help our users, and we can negotiate it between our two endpoints, and so let's go build that and do it. And so we did. Um, another thing that we do is um, we don't block connection requests on DNS lookup. We are willing to make a connection attempt with a stale DNS record as long as we then asynchronously look it up. If things have changed after the fact, which does sometimes happen, but for the most part, you know, our pops stay up. We don't take them offline too often uh, unless there's something's on fire. Uh, so for the most part, you know, this asynchronous validation comes back with the IP address that we we're using anyway, and life is good, and we didn't block the request uh, necessarily waiting for this same answer that came back. Um, and finally, we also have the ability to do trace route on the phones. Um, as Netflix uh, mentioned, this is something that's been pretty useful for us uh, in terms of debugging routing issues and just having more visibility into the path that traffic is taking from the client back to, um, back to our data centers. And that's just not anything that we can see from our side. So uh, operationally, this is really useful for us. Um, and so again, that kind of gets me into the kind of whole ecosystem benefits here. Um, controlling the client side and controlling the server side gives you this really nice uh, kind of synergy of ecosystem where like things feed back on themselves and get better and better. Um, again, uh, we've got this trace route that runs on the client, and this information can get used by our networking and DNS teams to do better targeting of users and better capacity planning. Um, we can include uh, network quality in bug reports. So when people are complaining about uh, the app and they file a bug, typically the text is something like, Facebook doesn't work. Uh, and it's not very actionable, it's not very helpful, and you know, our user operations specialists are trying to like scratch their heads trying to make sense of these things, and it's really difficult to differentiate you know, what's an application bug, what's a server bug, what's, you know, <laughs> uh, when is it the case that the network just didn't work and thus nothing worked, uh, and this kind of bit of information helps them, helps them diagnose those problems a little bit better. Uh, and finally, we're able to make kind of end-to-end -end protocol changes because we control both sides of the conversation. Um, so yeah, that's mobile proxygen. Um, I'm try really trying to keep this short because we've all been here for a long time and I want to get to happy hour. So uh, very briefly, uh, mobile proxygen is, you know, it's a library, link it with apps, makes apps faster, more performant, gives you better observability into what's going on. Um, and we're gonna, probably going to open source it a little bit later this year. Um, we haven't done it right now, not because there's anything particularly, uh, uh, I don't know, secretive in it, but we have a small team and really can't afford to spend time kind of building a community, but uh, expect this to come out sometime this year. That's it. All right, we'll start the questions over here. Um, I know it's been built in the, um, for, for the mobile use case, but uh, could you use this for server-to-server -server in data center type uh, uh, use cases? Yeah, um, we absolutely can. Um, so uh, one of kind of the key components of the kind of the modularity architecture that I mentioned is that some of the pieces that we built are specific to mobile, or these are optimizations that only make sense in the mobile environment, but it's absolutely the case that you can uh, build pieces that are only useful in server environments as well. And um, some of our backend systems that are very latency sensitive, um, you may be able to guess what some of them are, uh, actually are starting to use this because it's very important for them to actually get uh, really kind of crisp performance and understand when performance does, when things are slow, they want to know why and they want to fix it. Questions? Download something on 
I mean, I, I, I see the mobile platform going down the path of what it was before my time, sort of in the 80s maybe, where you had to download an application on every PC and every application tried to use a good library, tried to redo stuff, and it was always a very crappy experience. And today, if you look at your phones, even if it ships with 16 gig of memory, you run out of it pretty soon because the moment you download enough applications, everybody's redoing most of this stuff just to give their own users a good experience. So have you thought about rolling some of this back into the browser so that the browser becomes an interface? I understand there's the push part, which is not so browser friendly. But the rest seems like it could go in. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a great question. I mean, you know, right now, there are, there are kind of a couple phases to this project. Uh, number one is to control our own destiny so that we can fix real problems that our users have today. But again, you know, part of the, part of the deal with this being open source is that we want to make, make sure that platform vendors are able to take this code and run with it where it makes sense for them. Um, you know, we don't gain a whole lot by, like, doing all this work ourselves and keeping it to ourselves. Like, we just want to make things better. And to the extent that platforms can adopt it, we would be happy to support that. It's made things better in terms of you know latency or error rates. Or yeah, absolutely. Um, so most of our improvements tend to show up uh, in the long tail of response times. Um, in general, um, the network stacks on iOS and Android right now, so they both support speedy out of the box, which is great. Um, and when things work, um, things work equally well on bo uh, both with our stuff and just with the native stuff. You know, if you've got a connection, there's no congestion. You've got good bandwidth. Like we're not going to make anything faster. Like things are already fine. Um, but where you start to see us have um, have kind of a positive impact are when things get spottier, when your network connection, uh, when you start to see a little bit of packet loss. You know, we've got things uh, that can, uh, for example, simulate TLP, uh, TCP's tail loss probes uh, using Speedy. We can send a Speedy ping frame to uh, basically uh, trigger fast retransmit is kind of the idea there. Um, we can also do things like um, um, avoid the case where um, when the initial SIN frame for a TCP connect uh, goes out, the timeout can be very long. It's typically, I think, three seconds. Um, so for us, if we don't get back a connection, if we don't get back uh, the SIN ACK in, it's like a couple hundred milliseconds, I don't remember the exact number, we go ahead and send another request right away. Don't wait for that thing to happen, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so all this stuff tends to show up on the long tail. Um, the you know up you know up to you know P50 or even P75 is about the same, um, but again like a lot of our users, particularly uh, in kind of emerging markets that are important for us, are on these networks that don't behave all that well. All right, well please uh, let's uh, thank uh, Peter as well as all the speakers, all the speakers from today. So thank you all. Just a couple of a couple of notes here. Uh, there, there's actually happy hour in that uh, that outside garden area. There are a couple of bars. So please hang out. Um, a bunch of us look for us in Facebook shirts. Are, are happy to talk. The spe a bunch of the speakers will be around as well. Um, and also from the little mobile networking exercise, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, connecting and talking here too. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, we've got the, the the Facebook group. Hopefully some of you have joined that already. Um, we posted a survey for the event. We'd love to get your feedback. Actually, when you go through the survey, there's a little passcode at the bottom. Uh, you can use that passcode to redeem. You can get a T-shirt uh, uh, for, for the event. So um, please, please fill out the survey. It's really, uh, it's really great for us to kind of get that feedback on how we can make the event better, uh, what you liked about it. Um, the, and the closed group also is a great way to, like I said, to keep on um, finding out about future events. Right. Um, if you're interested in those tech talks or in those, uh, um, we'll post them there. But then, if you want to be on kind of that distribution list, put that in your survey. There's a survey. Uh, there's a little area there where you can say, "I want to be part of future networking events here uh, that we host like this." Um, with that, I think uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we want to go. Thank you all very much, and we'll talk to you some more. All right.